Thank you, Lord. I want you to grab the hand next to you and say, you're getting your blessing today. You're getting what you came for. And tell them, I don't even need to covet your blessing. Because I'm getting one just as good. Amen. You may be seated, saints of God. And I want you to take your Bibles or your iPads or your iPhones. And I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. You are entering in divine fellowship with the Word this morning. And I pray that you take this, you capture it with such faith and such bold courage and tenacity that it becomes you. How many of you know that when the word gets hidden in here, you become that word, you become that living promise? See, a lot of times churches get so full of head knowledge, we've got the revelation of the promise, but no experience of the promise. And God this morning is wanting to take us just out of the head knowledge for a moment and give you an encounter, give you an experience so that your faith can say amen. In Luke chapter 15, this is a familiar story. Hallelujah. Are you ready for this? Tell the person next to you with a smile, ah, I'm ready. And he said, there was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the part of the property that falls to me. And he divided the estate between them. Notice that he didn't say, okay, one son, I'm going to give you your portion. He gave it to both, right? Are you with me? And not many days after that, that means from the moment he received the inheritance, there was a span of time. Remember that. All right. Not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and moved out. And he journeyed into a foreign or a distant country. And there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose. And the Amplified, I love this, it says, free from restraint. It says that he wasted his fortune in, fortune in reckless and loose living. And when he had spent all that he had, a mighty famine came upon that country, and he began to fall behind and be in want. So he went and forced himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed hogs, pigs, swine. And he would gladly have fed on and filled his be belly with the carob pods that the hogs were eating. But they could not satisfy his hunger. And nobody could give him anything better. Then when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have enough food? I love that when he said he came to himself. Remember that statement as well. He said, I will get up and go to my father and I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Even then, he's trying to reduce his identity. Remember that statement. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And the Bible says, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him fervently. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to, and I'm going to come back to this, this text uh, in, a couple, uh, in a couple moments, but I want to build you some scenery around what is happening here in Luke 15. In this 
what we have known as to be a prodigal son story, we see that there are four characters in this story. Now, I'm going to pull your eyes away from the prodigal for a moment because the focus on this story, the way I'm, I'm coming at this angle, is not about necessarily just the prodigal. But there is one character in this story that, that when every time I've ever heard this preach, it goes on as nameless. It's never even mentioned, never even considered, never even thought about. Yet he is equally important to this story as the prodigal. Stay with me. We have a father in this story who has two sons. And then we have this nameless character or the Bible says this nameless citizen that was in a foreign and distant land of which the younger son, the prodigal, attaches himself to in the times of adversity. How can someone so vitally important have absolutely no relevance or reference point in Scripture? Why wasn't he named? Why didn't God disclose to us an identity of who this citizen was? Have you ever wondered who that was before? Anyone ever asked God the question, I wonder who that citizen was? If the church today would begin to ask that question, you would see herds and legions of devils suddenly exposed. And you would see a whole lot less oppression over God's people than we do right now. If they would ask the question. Because the, the, the answer here is not some nameless citizen, some nameless hog farmer in a distant land. The answer here, the one that was nameless here, is Satan. It was the adversary. It was a devil that had been set up to bring a prodigal out of the house. His name is never mentioned. There's no reference point given to him other than calling him a citizen. But if we ask the question, it, God will show us that this character becomes relevant when you begin to see what happens when we get up out of the house and out of the blessing of God and out of the will of God into the arms of one who had been waiting all this time. That nameless character, you see, must remain anonymous. That's why there was no name given. That's why it was concealed. See, how many of you know that the devil uh, 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 is strong when his identity remains concealed, anonymous? How many of you know that he does his best work when he is invincible? How many of you know that, that as long as he stays draped in the shadows, he can wreak havoc without anybody ever detecting who he is? I say this all the time. Good deception goes undetected. Are you here? See, the devil's fortification in this story was in the shadows. Now we have a certain man here who had two sons, and we see, we just read that the younger of the two sons said to his father, give me, one translation says my inheritance, one says portion, one says substance, one says what is owed to me. Multiple different variations on that. But I love when it says that give me the portion of the goods or, or as one says, give me the substance of my inheritance. How many of you know that you as a child of God have an inheritance full of substance? I love that word substance. Faith is the evidence, is the substance that faith produces. How many of you know that in your promise contains substance? It's not just empty words. That's for a dead religion with no God. But see, when God speaks, he produces substance. Your faith lays hold of it and takes it to the amen side. Amen. Are you here? Oftentimes, we have taught that the reason the son asked for his portion was because of greed. How many of you ever heard that before? 
How many of you ever uh, just kind of put your heart on that to say, oh, you know what? He, he, just, he was just after wealthy, riotous living. He was greedy. He wanted all the wealth. Greed had nothing to do with this story. There was something more deeper here that we've got to uncover. This young son did not ask his father for his inheritance to change the standard of his living. As he was heir from a wealthy dynasty already, why did he need to change his standard of living? He had it, he had it all anyway. He was born into money. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He, 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 was, he was raised up with servants serving him. He was a prince of a, a, in a palace, so to speak. He had anything anyone ever could ask for. He, no matter what his father gave him, he could not be richer than what he already was. So don't tell me it has anything to do with greed. Had nothing to do with monetary value at all. The problem was is that he wasn't dissatisfied with the benefits of the house. The problem was he wanted control of the house. And he wanted dominion over his destiny. He was not looking for a lust of money or greed or anything like that. He was looking for freedom to do his own thing. He wanted control over his own future. That is what led the young prodigal out of the house into a distant land. Notice that the older son never left the house. And notice that it wasn't that the, the father just gave half of it to one son and the son took it and left. He gave it equally to both. One had the wisdom to stay. One had the foolishness to leave. And so he journeys into a distant land with the wealth of his family fortune. And he journeys into a land and meets a citizen when all the money had been spent. One thing that, that, that is important to see here in this story is how people react differently to the blessing of God. Some get blessed and they, their whole world gets turned upside down. Some get the blessing of God and will always honor God with that blessing. The arrogance doesn't enter in. Pride doesn't enter in. They stay humble. They, they stay in humility. And the ownership of that blessing always gets reverted back to God. The older son had the wisdom to stay right there in the house. The younger son wanted control of his destiny and took family fortune outside the house. How many of you ever met people that all of a sudden got blessed and then they just stopped talking to people? They get a, they get a new dress, they get a new suit, they get, a, they get a new house, and all of a sudden now they're living at a level that's above their, 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 their people that they hung with. You ever met people like that? That all of a sudden they get a little blessing, they get a taste of blessing, and all of a sudden they can't shake your hand no more. It, it, it's like they've left one side of town and now they've went uptown. Isn't that wild how people react to blessing differently? And then, all right, let me, let me share this with you. This is kind of a funny story. Um, years ago, uh, when I was young and full of, when I was a, when young in the ministry, I should say, and full of unsanctified boldness. I'll say it that way. Um, it took me 18 years to figure out what that meant. Um, <laughs> thank God I learned. I remember being in a, in a service one night, and I had just, for those of you who are, who are in your happy day in the 80s and 90s, you'll know what I'm talking about. How many remember the Swatch watches? Yeah, I see some of you, know, yeah, I know what you're talking about, Pastor. 
It's a, Swiss for, it's a Swiss company that makes watches, and they call them swatches. And it, very popular in the, in the latter part of the 80s and 90s, and still very popular in Europe. It's a European fashion. Well, I, I, I came across one that I just fell in love with, and that was the day that I would wear, I don't wear jewelry, but I, I wore a watch. And this was a scuba swatch. And it was made out of titanium. And the, the really cool thing was you can take it in so many feet below water and it wouldn't burst and it wouldn't get, get ruined or anything. It was amazing. I love that watch. And I was sitting in a service and I had it maybe a year and I was just blessed. Man, that thing just glowed. I mean, you know, it was a big piece of ornament around my wrist. And I, you know, I'm just happy, right? And I'm standing there and all of a sudden God tells me, I need you to give that away tonight. And I kind of look behind me like somebody's trying to play a joke on me because that wasn't God. God would never say anything like that. So I just kind of moved over. I thought, I'm going to worship on this side for a while. And God said again, I want you to give that watch away. And I thought, well, God, who am I going to give it to? And he pointed right to the one that I was supposed to give it to. And you know what I tried to do? I tried to negotiate with God. I said, well, God, if he needs to tell time, why he can't just call me? And I'll tell him what time it is. And so all through the service, I wrestled with that. God, I don't want to give that. So I spent money on that watch. It was a blessing. It was a blessing to me. And at the end of the day, that's what mattered. It was blessing me. God, understand that I like my watch. I want to keep my watch. I don't want to let my watch go. And God just kept pounding. I want you to give it away. I provided the money to, for you to get that to begin with. He won the argument, as he always does. And at the end of the service, I walked up and said, bro, I just want to bless you with something. Actually, i got to be honest, I don't want to bless you with this, but God wants you to have it. <laughs> and I put that in his hands, and he looked at it, because he knew, he goes, good God. He said, what do you mean you're going to give this? And I said, yeah, God just wants you to have this. Be super blessed. And I guess when I need to tell Tom, I'm going to have to call you to tell me how time it is. <laughs> just jokingly. And, you know, I, he gave me a hug, and it just made his day. And I got in the car, I thought, man... I love that watch. And I told my wife, I said, when I get home, I'm going to order me another one. I can't be, I love that watch. And you know, I couldn't order it. Couldn't even find it. It's like God just closed it out. Unavailable, discontinued. I thought, see God, I could have had a discontinued watch. Someday it could have been worth money. See, you try to argue with God that way, see. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, God starts dealing with me about something. And because I thought I was somebody, I thought I, I thought I was, man, I was just the, just the arrogance. You like my watch? See, see, let me tell you, see that? Did you see that? Isn't that nice? And it was a blessing. But when God said, give up the blessing because I want to use it to bless someone else, I didn't, I never heard that concept before. And I thought, God, that's stretching my faith. And that's the first time that I understood there's a difference between a blessing and a material possession. Mm. Two, three, four months went by and I was in a revival service. I had learned the lesson. Heart had changed. More tender. I was giving suits away. I was giving anything I could to give away because I, I, I loved the, the fruit that that produced spiritually. Yeah. And i never forget, I was in a, sitting in the front row of a revival service, Southern Illinois. And I had no watch. And the brother that was preaching that night never met that brother before in my life from a different city, and he just flew him in to preach this message. And he's, he's preaching, and it was a huge, uh, huge uh, convention area. And he's walking and preaching out of nowhere. He stops right in front of me and then kind of takes another step and then takes a back step like this and stood there in the middle of his message and went completely silent. And he just stared at me. I thought... And this guy seeing the devil or something? No, I need, I mean, what, what, man, what in the world? You know what I mean? I just kind of start, you know, when people just start staring at you for a minute, like, what in the world did I do? And you know what he did? He took a step back and looked at me and he said, you know what, brother? God just spoke to me and he wants me to bless you with this. Took his watch off and put it in my hand. I looked down at this thing and this was one of those heavy watches. <laughs> you, you know those watches you need, you need an extra pair of hands to put it on for you because it's so, I'm thinking... Good God, this is probably a hundred times more valuable than the watch I gave away. And didn't know me for nothing. And I thought, thank you. And he goes, no, 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 don't thank me, because I really didn't want to give it to you. 
He said, thank God he wants to bless you with it. And I cried like a baby. Because I understood that the blessing wasn't in a material possession. That watch could have been a $2 watch, a 99-cent watch. But to know that God would stop a man of God in the middle of a message in front of 3,000 people and acknowledge a young man didn't know nothing about nothing to show him that what he released months ago produced fruit. Never wore that watch. Never wore it. It's not that I had anything. It was a beautiful, very expensive watch. But you know what I did? Gave it away like a year later. God told me to bless somebody else with it. I wonder since then how many hands that watch has changed over. And that's something. Point being is that some people react differently in the blessing. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like tithe and offering. And, I, and again, I'm not preaching on money or anything like that because I'm actually going into a totally different direction. But I'm going to say something to you. I've had times where people have came and and just reach out their hand after I preach, and and there's a wad of money in it. I'll look at that and walk away thinking, well, what in the world? And then you get so puffed, it's like, well, God, thank you. And so the next time you shake hands, you expect money in it. It was a joke. (laughs) But there's a difference, see. God had to deal with me on that because he said, I wasn't paying you. I was blessing you. The young prodigal wanted paid, not blessed. You see, there's a difference with understanding the boundaries of that blessing, the freedom that's within that blessing, the joy that's in that blessing. Did you know that, that and I had to learn this lesson, that if, if we pay our tithe because we, we believe that we have to pay God, we'll never be faithful in our tithing. Never. Never be consistent as long as you look at a tithe as a payment to God. God don't need your money. God don't need my money. God's got enough money. He's got all the money. He don't need, he don't need to pay a bill. Amen? <laughs> Say amen, somebody. Come on now. Point being is that the blessing of God stewardship, let me say it this way, is required, it's just as important in your giving as it in your, is in your receiving. Does that make sense? We, we've met people before that had a Sherry and, and I over their house and would, would give us massive amounts of money hoping it would sway us to make a decision in church. Isn't that wild? Like if I just pay the pastor. You know, if I can, if I can maneuver with that somehow and force a decision. You ain't forcing nothing. Amen? <laughs> God Almighty. Whew, hallelujah. Let me get past that day. Glory to God. Let me get back to the story. Are you still alive? Yeah. You didn't disconnect, did you? All right. Stay with me here. Church today is full of prodigal sons making the same mistake as this younger son did. And, and when I began to look at this this week, I thought, God, what, what motivated this young man to leave the blessing, to go to a distant land and attach himself to a devil, to attach himself to one that was far away from the will of God? Now, hear me on this. This younger brother, had he stayed in the house, would have never left the covering. He would have never left the roof of blessing, the roof of covenant. But he did. And the reason he did is because the enemy knew that in order to get this young son out of the house, he would have to have something that would entice him or lure him or seduce him. There would be something that he would have to do in order to get this younger son out of the protection. And you know what it was? He sent to this young man a restless spirit. (laughs) 
What the younger son didn't understand is that the favor, the real favor, the real power of God in his life was up in the blessing of God. Tell the person next to you, don't leave the house. You leave the house, you leave the blessing. And I'm not talking about a material house now. <clears throat> so the enemy sends a restless spirit to this young son. And you've got to understand that blessing now has no, has, is not equal to how much money we have in the bank or the kind of clothes that we wear, or the kind of car that we drive, or the kind of house that we have. Did you know that it has nothing to do with blessing, although they could be product of the blessing of God? You understand what I'm talking about? Don't get confused, because some people say, well, look, I'm blessed because I drive a Cadillac. Well, no, you're a fool if you don't got the money to pay for it. <laughs> See what I'm saying? The truth of the matter is that you can be broke and still be blessed. You can ride the bus and still be blessed. You, you, your wardrobe may consist of hand me dance and you may still be blessed. Amen. Why? Because Jesus said himself, a man's life is not consistent of the things of which he possesses. Amen. Material blessing means nothing in, in value of your blessing. We all understand that, right? Okay, now let me move on. In the blessing... Your adversary has a tough time dealing with that. He don't want you blessed. He worries at your blessing. He, he's nervous when the blessing of God comes. He's extremely intimidated when God's people begin to walk in the blessing. When you walk this earth, under the blessing of God, you're intimidating principalities everywhere you go. And, and it's one thing to be in the blessing and then to lose it or adulterate it out and, and to be completely vanquished from it. But when you and God's people learn to walk in the blessing of God on earth and stay up under the blessing of God, we will, we will bring principalities down and powers down. They will yield to that thing. Why? Because in the blessing is covenant power. In the blessing of God is, is, is eternal or that eternal realm of glory of God. Hallelujah. That's why when, when you read in Isaiah 60 about arise and shine, the glory of God has come upon you. Another way to say that, the blessing of God has come upon you. If we stay up under that blessing, we stay up under the shadow of the Almighty. And as long as you and I walk the earth under the shadow of the Almighty, we'll never have to worry about a storm cloud coming. Are you getting what I'm saying here? See, hell has a tough time with you being blessed. Now, some people try to apologize the blessing away. God blesses you, thank God. Don't boast about it. There's a difference now. Boasting in pride and boasting in the Lord. See, some people get super blessed and then when they see somebody that, that, that is not blessed in whatever fashion, they, they feel like they have to be just as out of blessing as that person is. Enjoy your blessing. Amen? Just don't be arrogant with the blessing. You can be arrogant. You can be, you can be arrogant under a blessing of anointing. You may be, you may be anointed to, 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 to play the piano or to play drums or to preach the, the paint off the walls. You may be anointed in those areas, but when you begin to boast in the gifting, instead of, of, of rejoicing in the experience of the blessing, something's gone wrong. Are you still here? You know where that word blessed comes from? comes from a, uh, in Latin actually, it comes from a word hap, H-A-P. And that is a derivative of the word happy or happen. Did you know that in Latin to say hap means that you are happy because something happened? Amen. When you say you're happy, it's because something had to happen to make you feel good. Amen. That's what the word happy means. And I tell people all the time, don't get just focused on being happy. Get the joy of the Lord in because there's two totally different realms. Happy has to come with a circumstance or something to, to get you all stimulated and, and, and feel good. Joy is an eternal, the eternal realm of God's presence that you and I have free access to anytime we want. Jesus told his disciples, just enter into the joy of the Lord. That, you know what the difference is? If, if you take happy away and your flesh will begin feeding on something else to make it happy. You know what I'm saying? That's why we look 
at that, that peace is the absence of conflict. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of the person of Jesus Christ. Same way with joy. Happiness is, happiness is not uh, an emotion because you have something that made you feel good. It is the presence of Jesus. I'd rather walk in joy than be happy. Amen. Because when you're in joy, man, the world can be collapsing around your feet. And you can laugh and you can look at that and rejoice and give God glory because you're not altered by what's going on in the vortex of life. You're stout and you're postured and you're, you're standing in the framework of the Word of God that could be shaken but can't be destroyed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Happiness you can, you can erect with sand and stubble and weeds. How do I know that? Because some people can walk the shores of a beach and get happy. Some people can adore plants and get happy. Man. Nothing wrong with that. I like the sand myself. But I've been, I've been in times where the sand, I, I couldn't get to a faraway beach in order to take the misery away. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go out and shop. I used to have shop therapy all the time. And, and I tell my wife, uh, my Jesse actually in the back, we kind of used to do that all the, all the time. We need shop therapy. So let's just go to the mall. That was like therapy to us. And then I realized that can get expensive. <laughs> Joy's much cheaper. Amen. Come on now. Joy's much cheaper. <clears throat> Hallelujah. The word blessed means to succeed over adversity. If we were not going anywhere in God, the devil would leave you alone. If the word wasn't germinating in you and producing fruit, the devil would leave you alone. Haven't you gone through something over the last couple months? Man, some of us have truckloads of Stuff that we've had to go through. Stuff that's like, I didn't even, I, you can't even put a description to that chaos. And one thing to remember is that, that sometimes we go through that because you're moving in God. And you're stirring up dry dust that has been dry. Have you ever seen water hit? I, 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 uh, I, I saw something uh, recently that just blew me away. That, that one of an eyewitness account, remember a couple years ago in Japan when that earthquake hit and it brought that tsunami into that, in that coastal city. I, when I heard that, I started, I mean, it was sad, obviously, because he was talking about the destruction. But when I heard that, I, I just shouted out, like, glory to God. Because when he was talking about when a tsunami comes, he said it, before the water hit the shore, it was like this massive dust wave that was coming at him. And then I heard that, I thought, yeah, that's why just before the, the waters of God come, it's, He's going to come and, and that motion, that, that kinetic energy that a tidal wave creates stirs up all the dust, moves the old crusty earth out of the way because a new, <laughs> you're not even getting this, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank God for the tsunamis of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. How many of you need a tsunami right now? See, remember, if the enemy, if you weren't going anywhere in God, the devil would leave you alone. But what you need to remember is that God said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. He, no weapon formed, no demonic strategy conjured up. He can bake it, fry it, stir it, boil it, grill it. He can do whatever he wants to do to try, but no weapon, the Bible says, no, if, say that with me, no weapon formed or fashioned against me, shall prosper. Now, we didn't say that. God said that over us. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, can I, can I get back to the story? Before I forget, come here. give that to Brother Ken. He just walked in. Brother, I got to give this. I got to interrupt the subject to give this to you before I forget. I meant to do it last week. Can I get back to the story? How many of you felt like the enemy tried to stir you up or set you up? Have you ever felt conspired against? Like in prayer, the first thing he says, God, I want to say a conspiracy has been formed against me. (laughs) 
The devil knows that we're blessed and he's worried about it. He, he, see, he, he doesn't want for you to enjoy the blessing or to manifest the blessing or to display the blessing in any fashion. The moment you say you're blessed, the moment the word of God is declared over you, the enemy says, all right, now what can I do to discredit that blessing? Because if the earth, if the darkness of the earth and the darkness of, of a lost soul can come in contact with someone who's blessed, guess what they want to do? There ain't no sin in the world that can value that. And the next thing they say, how do I get some of that? And they begin inquiring, well, if you're blessed, I can be blessed. See, that's why the enemy works at discrediting the presence of the blessings of God over an individual's life. Because if he can erase the blessing, he can erase the trace. But in order, now listen to this, in order for the prodigal son to end up where he ended up, you can't tell me that the enemy didn't have a master plan for this young son. He was a prince in a palace, so to speak, in a wealthy family, but unfortunately had been targeted by the enemy. And so the enemy begins to seduce this young man with a restless spirit. He, it, it's amazing how restless you can get even in the blessings of God. But in order for him to lose what he had, the devil had to get him out of the house. See, people don't do well when they leave the house. When you're not in the house, you're exposed. You're out in the open. And this is what happened to the prodigal son. He got restless in the blessing. I've never seen such a spirit of restlessness in the church. Being restless will make you crazy. It'll make you psychotic. It, 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 it'll give you all kinds of paranoia. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it'll make you freaky. So the enemy sends a restless spirit. People are so restless today, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And when they get there, they don't know what to do or to do it with. They get restless. Did you know that people will get restless to leave the house to come to church? And then when they get to church, they get restless to leave the church and go back to the house. Isn't that wild? Before you, get, before you leave the house for the church, man, you're bustling all over the place. It's all crazy and chaotic. And, and do the shoes match? Do the socks match? Do I got my eyebrows right? Do I got everything that in place before I leave? And you're in a hurry to get to church. And then when you get to the presence of God, you're in a hurry to get out of it. That's restlessness. People who are thin want to be overweight. And, and, and they're looking for, do I need to take nutrients? Do I need to take power shakes? Do I need to take stuff to put on some extra pounds? And then the people with extra pounds are trying to lose the extra pounds and be thin. You got heavyweights wanting to be lightweights and lightweights wanting to be heavyweights. And there's, there's restlessness. You got young people trying to act old, old people trying to act young. It's, it's amazing how young people, what they'll do in order to look distinguished and, and elderly and mature. And then you've got old people go out and buy a Corvette when they're 65 years old and they, and they get their hair dyed and they get on a new... Because they, they want to look younger. They want to appear younger. You've got young people want to be old. Old people want to be young. And a whole lot of people making a fortune over that madness. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy chaos. You got, you got some, oh, good God. You got, you got some that, 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 that have long hair, want short hair. Some that have no hair are gluing hair on. Good God. Some got jobs that don't want their jobs. Some don't have jobs or wanting their jobs. Have you ever went home and said, God, I hate this job? <laughs> yeah. And, and then when you don't have a job, say, like, God, I wish I had that job. It's restlessness. It's, 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 it's utter chaos. And then you got single folk. Oh, come on now. You got single folk that want to be married. Married folk want to be single. And the married, po and the married folk want to be single. Got single people over there saying, well, look, give that brother to me. Give that wife to me. I'll take him. Good God. 
Married wanting to be single, single wanting to be married. It's chaos. It's restlessness. You see what I'm saying? When a spirit of restlessness gets deep down, you aren't happy anywhere. And suddenly you find yourself to the point where all you want to do is run away. If I can just run away from the madness. You'll try to run away from promise. You'll try to run away. Even the blessing of God won't be appealing anymore. Imagine being under the favor and the blessing of God like this prodigal son did not have a want in the world. But because he did not understand his covenant and the covering protection, went to his father and broke his father's heart by saying, look, I want to do my own thing. Give me half of my... In fact, God, I want you... Or imagine saying this to your dad. Dad, I'm going to rebel and I want you to pay for it. That's exactly what the young prodigal son did. Had an agenda to rebel and wanted his daddy to pay for it. God, that's chaos. That, that's madness. When we're restless, we'll run from ministry, we'll run from giftings, we'll do whatever we need to do just to get out of the house. Tell the person next to you, stay in the house. Stay in the house. house. See, the only problem with the prodigal son is that he left the house. And see, now now listen, he didn't sit down with with a map and map out his journey to a distant land. He didn't even know where to go. He just wanted out. He wanted control. He wanted the the keys to his own destiny. And you know, the father, what's interesting about the father, and I can't understand this, I'm still asking God, like, God, why did the father pay for it? If he knew that the younger son was headed into a life of rebellion, why would would he deplete half of a fortune for that? I I still can't get, I I can't comprehend that. God's going to have to give me the, because there's purpose behind that, obviously. Because the shape of the son when he left was totally different from the shape of the sun when he returned. Amen. 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 And so he, he, he gets this restless spirit and so unhappy, and then you know what happens? The devil stood outside the house. He said, come on, come on. Step outside the house. I can't touch you in the house. I... I I, 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 I can't destroy you when you're in the house. But step out. Step out. I'll show your flesh things that you can't imagine. Come on, step out. I'll, I'll show you things that'll make you feel good, make you look good, make you sound good. I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Just step out of the house. Satan took Jesus to the same spot. Step out of the house. I'll give you all of this, Jesus, if you'll step out of the house. So he stood there. Step out. Just step out. Let me get within reach of you. Because if I can get my hand on your throat, then I can bring you to the ground. And if I can bring you to the ground, I can drag you to a foreign land. And when I get to the foreign land, I can take you and I can chain you to a destiny God never called you to. I can strap you to a citizen who will drive you from the palace into a mud pit. And you think you're blessed now, let me show you what it's like when you're feeding pigs and swine. If you'll step out of the house, I've got you. But as long as you stay in the house, all I can do is just lurk in the shadows and walk around that house. But when I see you step out, then I've got you. The prodigal son had no idea what awaited him. Do you think if the father sat him down at the table and said, look, I'm going to give you half this fortune, but you're going to end up feeding swine, he would have laughed at his dad. If I would have said, well, that's the case, I'll just enjoy the blessing here. Amen. Forget me. I don't want, I don't like pigs anyway. I've never been a pork fan. If you're pork fans, I've got, you know, God bless you, whatever. Let me move on. Um, But, but imagine, and I worked in a hog confinement for a day and I'll never do that again. Good God. But, 
but anyway, oh God, give me, give me terrifying visions of the past. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, phew, I've got to get away from that one. <laughs> Good God. Um, but imagine though, just for the sake of, just imagine this young man been taking care of his whole life under the blanket of covering. As long as he was in the house, he had the protection, the covering, the destiny. All the means to achieve whatever God was calling him to achieve. Outside the house, he was prey for the vultures. Interesting that it says there, remember at the beginning there was several days that he had the blessing. He had the ownership of his destiny. And in those several days got to the point where, look, I, man, I can do better than this. Dad, I'm taking the wealth and I'm journeying into wherever I had no idea. And leaves the house and gets dragged into a foreign land. Now, it's interesting because the wealth that he carried wasn't substance. It was wealth. It was money that he had in his pockets, not substance. Hear me on this and, and capture this revelation. He was, he was in the substance under the house. He was in the manna in the cloud, in the presence, in the glory, in the house. Access to the bounty was there because he was in the house. He was under covenant. Now he takes wealth from the storehouse, leaves the presence and favor and protection of God, and journeys into a foreign land. The money's there to spend it. See, money will give you time. Money will sustain you for a time. But that's money. It's not substance. See, he could have had wagons full of treasure and probably did that he carried. But every cycle of the wheel spinning, he was losing money and time was running out. And when famine came and there was no more funds to buy food, guess what he resorted to? Instead of going back to the covering, he chooses that it might be better to feed pigs. Have you ever walked through a pig farm? I don't have a whole lot of pigs here in Texas. Thank God we got cattle. Amen. Do they even have pig farms here? They do. Have you ever lived by a pig farm? Have you ever, have you ever drove your car by a pig processing plant? Have you ever walked through a fenced-in area with 30, 40, 50 head of swine? You have? Who has? Was it enjoyable? Now, imagine sitting at a glorious banquet table with the father and the family, not having to worry about feeding swine. What would you choose? Isn't that wild? Isn't that crazy how such a restless spirit can be so seductive that you'll sell out a gifting or give an anointing away or just the peace of knowing that you're in God's will. That right there is worth more than because I've been out of God's will and I've been in God's will. Being in God's will feels a whole lot better. You can sleep at night when everything's chaos around you. It's like you're sleeping in your own boat. Sleep while the storm's gone. <laughs> Good God. But this nameless enemy took a person who once was a prince and made him a pauper in a swine pit. That's why I'm saying that this nameless citizen has a lot of relevance because that takes skill. Don't ever think your adversary is some buffoon 
that stands outside a church door and says, look, here I am, I'm sin. I'm here to deceive you. I'm a false religion. Have a pamphlet and believe. Don't ever think that there's not recourse, that the enemy just broadcast his intentions. He's good at what he does, and he was very good at leading this young man out of a palace into a mud pit. Tell me that takes skill. But the glorious thing was, and this is the point I want to make, and this was actually the whole core of the, of the message this morning, is that there's a fragment of Scripture in verse 17 when he says that he came to himself. It has same relevance as in, I think it's in 1 Samuel chapter 30 when the Bible says that David encouraged himself. He came to himself. In other words, that moment that he came to himself, guess what happened? The understanding of his real identity got restored. And in a moment he thought, why am I in a pit with pigs when I should be in the palace with the Father? And it it didn't matter if it would take him a year to get back. The important thing is, is that moment when he came to himself, you know what happened? He turned back to the house. Direction got restored. Good God. Do you know what the word encourage means? It means to seize courage. It means to hold the line. That's why Paul said, I fought the good fight of faith. There is authority that God gives His people for in times of famine there is provision to encourage yourself. How many of you have ever been to a place where, man, you call a sister or brother wanting a word of encouragement all they do is get you more discouraged? <laughs> yeah, you go, to a, you go to a, you pay money for a conference, go to the conference, come to find out you're in worse shape when you leave than when you came. Because you're looking for the answer. Or, or you go through so much and, and, and you, you can quote scripture and you, you, can, you can just pray and pray and pray but nothing happens. The, nothing restores that. But hear me today. God has given us authority to encourage ourselves in the Lord. David went back into Ziklag and found that everything he held dear was taken from him. And now they were pursuing his life. They wanted his kingdom. They wanted his, they wanted his, his title. They wanted, they wanted that brother gone. Everything. Son, his own son turned against him. Had family turned his wife telling him he was a crazy maniac for worshiping God. He had everything coming against him. And when there was no place that this brother could have turned, except for within. How can a man of God or a woman of God encourage him or herself? You encourage yourself by tapping into the oasis within. What is the oasis within? The Spirit of God within you. The the Word of God within you. The worship service within you. The praise service within you. The authority and power of God within you. That's how you encourage yourself. Amen. David had no one to turn to, sat there in the field and, and decided to myself, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to stay defeated. I've got inside what it takes to encourage myself. If I, if I can't get a prophecy, if I can't get someone speaking, thus saith God in that moment, at least I've got the word of God hidden in here. And even David, he even went back and, and, and see that there's a scripture in Proverbs 23 that Solomon wrote. He said, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. See, David wasn't about to sit there and, and gloat on about how much destruction had came to his life. He wasn't going to go the way of Job or go the way of one that had all the blessings and everything taken from him and then waller in the mud pit. Something in David said, look, I got to get back to the house. I got to go back to the covering. 
I got to go back to, to the place of where I'm safe and the place of where I'm protected. And, and, and if, I have to, if I have to go back and recount the days of old. You remember when he wrote that in Psalms 143, he said, I remember the days of old and I meditate on all your works and I muse on the works of your hands. He said, I'll meditate on your glorious splendor of your majesty and of your wondrous works until I die. Why? Because God, I know that if I set my affection towards you, that no matter how deep I've fallen in the pit, the moment I touch you, hallelujah, and the moment I touch heaven, you'll reach down and pull me out of the pit. Good God. See, courage is seized, hallelujah, when you begin to encourage yourself. See, David got up and got over it. See, believers today, they get knocked out and they stay out for the count. And then they get dragged off to the water bottle, to the little stool, and to the little towel, and to some little weight trainer to put stuff on your eyes so they won't swell shut. But see, David got knocked down, but he would get back up. And he would get knocked down, and he would get back up. And see, it wasn't in the knocking down that, the, that defeated the enemy. The, the, what defeated the enemy is every time he got back up, the devil was saying, look, that fool is up again. That means I'm going to have to come up with a new tactic. That mean, and then after a while, he just runs out of plans. He don't know what to do. So he ends up confused himself. And then he tries to go back and grab ten more others just like him. And then they realize the more you get knocked out, the more you get back up, you are walking as the apple of God's eye. Hear me now. David had in himself what was needed to bring him out of the pit. The prodigal son doesn't say that a prophet came and said, look, you need to go back to the house. He had nobody except a citizen owner and a bunch of pigs. But he knew in himself where he came from. And he came to himself and said, Lord, Man, I made a mess out of my daddy's fortune. <laughs> but thank God I didn't bankrupt substance. I may have depleted all of the material bank accounts that were given to me, but thank God I didn't bankrupt covenant. Thank God that the mistakes I made, and they were many, thank God that I know that when I get back to the house, the father of the house is going to stand with open arms and say, I forgive you, son. I'm not going to look at the air anymore, but I'm going to embrace you with love. I'm going to embrace you with forgiveness. I'm going to embrace you with affirmation because it's not that you're a distant, uh, uh, it's not that you're some distant stepchild that, or some, someone that I don't have a relationship. It was a father and a son, and there is no dad out there like our dad amen there's no father out there that would say son you better go back to the mud pit because you spent a little bit of money no 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 no. that's not the heart of the father the heart of the father will stand there and weep when he sees your back turned and walking away good God but he'll stand and rejoice and sing when he sees the face of his son coming back home what blesses God is when God's people, when they do get knocked out, they get up and they get over it. God, tell somebody next to you, it's time to get up and it's time to get over it. If you're going through chaos, it's time to get up and get over it. If you ain't got two nickels to rub together, it's time to get up and get over it. If you've got sickness that's lurking in the body, get up and get over it. Good God. Recognize that your substance is in righteous standing with God. Amen. Stand upon your feet.